This is one example. This patient we treated actually, there was a small malformation in the, uh, close to the right hilum here and there was a malformation on the left side. You can see the coils were placed and three years later, there is a new lesion which is developed here. There is a new lesion which is developed here and there is an additional lesion which is developing here. So clearly shows the importance of serial follow-up in this given, this group of patients. Here's another example here. There is, this is, this is an MR angiogram and another MR angiogram six years later, you can see these lesions which are increasing in size, these lesions which are increasing in size, but there are new lesions also developing. So essentially what, what I'm trying to emphasize is not only the lesions will increase over time, new lesions will develop over time. So therefore patient education is very critical to optimal management in this group of patients. So what should be the management strategy? When should you treat these patients? Patients with progressive enlargement, patients who have paradoxical embolization or who are symptomatic for malformation should always be treated if there is a feeding vessel which is big enough to take a device. Also based on the, the, the information which I provided to you in a, slides, a few slides earlier, malformations of a specific size or beyond have been shown to have much higher morbidity and mortality, so there should, therefore they should be treated irrespective of their symptomatic status. What should be the goals of treatment? Relieving the hypoxia and its, it, 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 its adverse effects is the goal of treatment. Prevention of complications such as neurological complications or high output failure is the goal of treatment. Now if you go back in literature, the first successful treatment of pulmonary artery venous malformation has been reported in the year 1942 by surgery and this actually over the next 40, 45 years or so remained the standard of care for treatment of pulmonary artery venous malformations. It was in the late 70s that endovascular management of this disease was reported and with the, with, the, with the developments which we have had in the endovascular techniques, it has become the standard of care today and this is the treatment of choice and other treatments are resorted to only if this treatment is not feasible or not available. Now, so what, which patients should be treated? Clearly patients who have optimal angiographic morphology. In the, in the early days, in the late 80s or early, uh, uh, late 70s or early 80s, patients in whom surgery was not considered because of poor operative risk, patients who had multiple or extensive bilateral malformations were, who were not suited for surgical management used to be offered endovascular treatment. But with the, with the results which have come up over the last many years, this this, this, this list of indications is largely superfluous and academic. Today, every pulmonary artery venous malformation, if it has a suitable angiographic morphology, should be treated by endovascular route. You have two catheters side by side. I will show you in a short while. One is used to retard the flow and the other is used to release the embolic material. Thirdly, in difficult situations, you can take a guiding catheter or a, or a diagnostic catheter into a distal location or a proximal location and take a micro catheter to release the embolic material as close to the neck as possible, what is called as coaxial technique. The, the success of this procedure depends upon choosing the optimal technique and choosing the optimal embolizing material. But whatever you do, it's important that you occlude the cross-sectional occlusion is essential and to do that what we usually do is because coils are the most commonly used material for this embolization, we create a scaffold as close as distally as possible by using a bigger coil and then place a coil within a coil and a coil within a coil to occlude it completely. Now this is an example of a single catheter technique. What we have done here is we have taken a diagnostic catheter as close to the, to, to the, to the neck of this malformation and through this diagnostic catheter we have released the coils. It can suffice, but what happens sometimes the flow is so dramatic, so rapid that you are mortally scared that this coil may embolize into the systemic circulation. This is what we used to do, I mean, this is a slide of I think 1983 or 84. At that time, what, what, you know, I, I used to experiment with various ways to retard flow. 
So what, what I would do is, you can see two catheters have actually gone parallel to each other from the systemic, from the, from the vena cava to the right atrium into the, into the, into the uh, close to the malformation. And we would take a variety, we have modified this in many, many times in different patients. What we would do is, we would take an endole catheter and a balloon catheter, a Swangans catheter, influence the Swangans so that we block flow. And then through the side of the Swangans, we will take a diagnostic catheter, endole catheter, and release the coils. Then there was this issue that the, when you release suddenly, it may just embolize. So what we would do, we have, we have ch changed the variation. We have taken the balloon catheter distally, blocked distally, and released the coil proximally, and then slowly, over a period of time, released these, uh, or, or, or deflated the balloon and taken out the Swangans catheter. Proximal occlusion versus distal occlusion. Both of these have been tried, but I must tell you, those were the days when we used, we, we didn't have much experience. This I am telling you of 1980s, nine, early 1990s. But we have practically abandoned all this. Distal embolization does not happen if you choose the size of your coils optimally. So you can use a single catheter technique. It's a much, a much simpler procedure, much less complicated procedure, and much quicker procedure. But the critical issue. In, in for successful embolization is get close as distally as possible. The reason is that because of steel phenomenon, you will not see normal branches before embolization. So if you block proximally, you will block normal branches which may be important for providing distal ventilation. That's one reason. The second reason is if you block very proximally, you leave a distal a area before the malformation uh, patent and this can become a reason for later recanalization. So for these reasons, you must block as distally as possible. Now, for about 20, 25 years, we have used coils for this embolization. But the, over the last few years, I have practically switched over to amplazer plugs. They are far more comfortable, they are far more predictable, and they are, there is much more control in these vis-a-vis -vis coils, and they, they do the job as effectively, probably more effectively than, than the coils. The only issue with amplazer plugs is those of us who have used them, the thrombosis does not develop immediately. So you are worried that this will block immediately or it will take a much longer period of time and in this process, in this period, cause hemoglobin, uh, uh, you know, RBC destruction and, and produce hemoglobinuria. Now, there is a very recent study which, 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 which was reported last month, actually last to last month, which has actually addressed this issue and shown that the occlusion time is, is just three minutes with the second generation amplazer plugs. So therefore, to my mind, we have stopped using coils and I would strongly recommend the use of amplazer plugs for the treatment of this group of patients. Now, what are the problems? The most common complication which develops after, after uh, embolization of pulmonary arteriovenous malformations is a pleuritic chest pain. This happens in about 13% patients and depends upon the size of the feeding artery. As the size of the feeding artery increases, the incidence of pleuritic chest pain also increases. It is usually self-limiting, usually lasts a day or two and goes away. Radiographic evidence of pulmonary infarction develops in a very small group of patients is not a serious Air embolism is an issue, so therefore you should be very careful when you are pushing in these devices, make sure that you are sucking, withdrawing and creating an air-free column within the embolizing catheter. That's very critical, especially because it's the venous circulation. DVT secondary to the puncture site problems has been reported in a small group of patients. Device migration is a small issue, but it's a much bigger issue with the detachable balloons because the over time. So therefore, we do not use detachable balloons at all in this setting. Now, post-treatment, what happens? Remember, when you set out to embolize these vessels, angiographic result is not critical. You are not there to, to ablate or to remove or to eliminate all venous mal ultra-venous malformations. Small residual malformations will remain in a majority of these patients. Unfortunately, till, till, uh, in, in the 80s and 90s, these used to, because of, because of the 
small size of the vessel, we did not have adequate coaxial catheters to get there and block them. So therefore, we left open the risk of paradoxical embolization. So despite the patient becoming asymptomatic, he still ran the risk of paradoxical embolization because of smaller arteriovenous malformations, which remain persistent.